All right, good evening, everybody, and welcome to our permanent home town hall. It's so good <laughs> to see you all here. Thank you for joining us. We're very excited to talk about how our mission is growing and our physical presence is growing. And what we have a lot to talk about. You can hear from a number of uh, different speakers tonight from uh, the school, from our architects. Uh, and uh, so with no further ado, I'm gonna start by handing it to Christiana from our building committee. Christiana. Hello and good evening, and it's very nice to be here and, and start the process of explaining what uh, all the information that we have to convey this evening. Um, first, I wanted to situate ourselves here on this side where we are, where we have been for nearly or maybe more than 25 years. We're currently in a leased, um, in a leased uh, property with the JCC being our landlords. And uh, on this site, we are uh, we have had this facility for 20 years, and in this facility, we are capped in terms of our the number of students that we can have on the site. We are capped at 435 students, and that's a hard cap, and can't go above that. And so, for many many years at, on the building committee, we have been um, searching for solutions that would allow us to uh, continue to. Um, build the size of our facility in terms of the actual number of students, but also in, in terms of the programs and everything that we want to offer to our students. So with that in mind, um, let's maybe go to the next slide. Not sure who, who's doing that. Someone yes, kicking. Yes. Oh. It's on the next slide. I'm not sure who's going to. Um, so, in terms of um, you know reaching our capacity here on site, we have been working for many many years to try to find a solution to that, and it, and kind of opportunistically found an, a, a way to purchase 2.5 acres just to the west side of the JCC, which is right around the corner here for you know the other building. And uh, at the time of that purchase, that was a property. Those are residential properties, and schools were. Uh, allowed to be on on those that zoning um, envelope and um, since then once we have purchased the properties the the Mercer Island um, the city of Mercer Island has actually changed the zoning and we were uh, then uh, in a situation where we could not build uh, a school on the site however the site itself is very valuable to us it has allowed us um, an opportunity to um, have land that belongs to us that we have built uh, value in and that will become the financial backbone to our next um, development in the in the Seattle region and over the years many we have pursued many um, areas within the greater Puget Sound area to find opportunities to set our school and find another property. And um, over the last couple of years now have been pursuing and, and have been lucky enough to purchase the property in, in uh, on Rainier, um, just on the east, uh, on the west side of, of I-90. And in that area, we are, it's a, it's a quickly changing neighborhood and um, it's a neighborhood that has now multiple light rail stations that are about to come online in the in the next year. Three to four other um, private schools have found a home in that neighborhood and are are have built campuses there and are being are very successful there. A lot of multifamily housing and commercial spaces are going into that area and it's rapidly changing and we feel very lucky to have um, found a. a full urban lot in that neighborhood that we can now develop our first phase on and then continue to grow into the property and uh, eventually have our entire um, school campus perhaps there. So I'm going to hand it over to Peter. Thank you, Christian. Hi, uh, I'm Peter. I'm also on the building committee and we're going to walk through where we've been expanding and how we're looking at the strategy for the school expanding in the hub. So of course, as Christiana met, we started with, we started here, we've been here 20 years. And then about a year ago, we opened the Factoria hub and that's for the young uh, preschoolers and excited uh, to know that we're going to open a second classroom there uh, coming January. 
And so we continue to build out the, these facilities and we're gonna then build out into uh, FAST Seattle and as Christiana walked us through that purchase process. So part of the thing that we're going through and planning for that school is the selection of who goes there, what part of the school should go over to that facility. And there's a number of considerations that we, we went around and around uh, to determine that. One of them is about the independence of the students themselves and what they, they can do in a, in a uh, separate facility. Um, we talked about the light rail options and transportation, how, how we can move around uh, grades from four to eight. So that's a, a, a more mature group than the, the very littles. So that's one consideration there, those, that maturity and the excitement of moving into the bigger school, the new school, the, the uh, graduation, if you will, as you go. Uh, I remember when my daughter was here at Mercer Island and going up to the second floor was a huge deal. It's a, a really big deal. And so going to the new school, we, we resonate with that. We, we go up into levels and we're able to then create more of a hub there. We have uh, facilities that uh, align with that age group too, including uh, a performance gym space as well. And we'll get into that more when we go through the design. Uh, other ideas, uh, the, the young kids have a lot more logistical concerns uh, when you're trying to pick up and drop off than being able to just drop them. They need to be walked in, they need to be checked in. Uh, there's a lot of logistical concerns. And unfortunately, right now, our, our capital campaign doesn't allow us to fit a parking garage to facilitate that pick up and drop off. Uh, so that's that's another uh, idea. Also, the operational aspects of the young littles and how uh, we're dealing with you know, the diaper changes, the very, very little little ones, uh, just the, the preschool recommend or uh, regulations that we have to do within this within the city and state. And so that leads us to the grades four through eight going into to the new location and then the way that we're structuring the development of the property will then bring in other classes as as we can now when we look at the the layout we have a lot of flexibility in that so grades four through eight and we talked about building hubs and building uh, uh, the ability to expand our population as we do that we have more flexibility then also to say well we might have more classrooms, more you know, eighth grade classrooms in a new place. Maybe we bring fourth grade back here, but there's a lot of flexibility in that consideration. Right. I think moving on to um, the next next slide, we talked about the Francophone and International Cultural Hub. We, we're moving into a very international community already. So Lower, Lower Beacon Hill, the Rainier Valley, uh, a very diverse uh, international community already. Um, I think we're the first real international component, uh, educational component that's in that area. And we, we bring that to those other schools as well. So the, the four other schools that uh, Steve mentioned before, those are all in, in that area. We'll talk about those in greater detail as uh, Malin uh, speaks, but you'll see how we then become in the middle of that educational and international hub uh, with a lot of capacity to welcome that neighborhood. Great, and I'm going to turn it over to Eric. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Peter um, and Christiana, for our building and co-chairs. So I'm also to say it. I'm very happy to be with you today. And so I'm the last person to talk about the context and the own environment before we pass it on to the, the architects that will, will show you the renderings and the visuals. So I try to keep it short. Um, but as you can see here uh, on this aerial view, uh, so now we are becoming, and we are already uh, a multi campus uh, school with the Factoria campus and our campus on Mercer and the one to develop uh, in Seattle. Um, so uh, we use uh, Factoria campus for tiny white pre-K uh, through uh, white pre-K. As Peter mentioned earlier, we'll have another classroom opening uh, very soon in January. 
Um, so we'll um, have our um, historic uh, campus here in Barcelona that will stay and will remain. Uh, so we are working with JCC now uh, in terms of extending uh, our lease agreement uh, because we'll keep our tiny white quickly through grade three uh, here um, in this uh, on this site and maybe more later. But uh, what we know already is, as I mentioned earlier, is grade four through eight. Uh, we'll uh, we'll have them also in, uh, in Seattle. So um, um, one thing that is important to uh, to mention is that because we have multi campuses, uh, some of our families might need uh, to uh, bring their kids to other campuses. So we have the luxury uh, to have a fleet of six buses uh, that will be very helpful. Uh, we don't have the routes yet, uh, and. Uh, the time and so on that, uh, as you know, will we'll open this campus in, in 2026, uh, but we'll be able to leverage uh, this asset and use them uh, to facilitate uh, uh, transportation and help and support our families. So, uh, and certainly use them also as a, as a shuttle. So this uh, campus uh, that we are going to build will be 30,000 square foot. Uh, and so, uh, uh, again, it's going to be for grade four, three, eight, and we are looking at 240 students uh, uh, at capacity. So next slide, please. So um, this is, uh, this, this area is very rich. There are a lot of things there. Um, and uh, talking about transportation, as you can see here, um, we'll have a light rail station coming up the Jen, the Jenkins uh, Park uh, light rail station. Hopefully it's going to open in 2025, maybe a little later. They're going to wait just for us to open our, uh, our campus. Uh, but those uh, stations, Beacon Hill and Mount Baker are already uh, operating. So which means that uh, uh, if uh, some of our families will take the light rail station, so we'll, we are seven blocks away from the station, which is about 10 minutes uh, walking distance. So um, uh, for the ones of you who know the area, Jefferson Park and the Gold Coast is pretty close. Uh, the Amegi Tennis Center, the Northwest African uh, uh, African American Museum as well. Uh, and we talked earlier also about the four schools, uh, the four other schools. So uh, uh, the area is very and it's rapidly evolving and changing. So maybe we can see that in the next slide. So uh, again, if you drove uh, around, so you must have seen uh, the, the, the big development that are happening now, the Grand Street uh, Commons housing development. Uh, Jazz Ed uh, will be across the street from us, so they haven't started yet, uh, but uh, it's going to happen soon. Uh, and so, and there are also some uh, um, housing happening there, like uh, uh, affordable housing and so on. Uh, and that's where we'll be. We'll be. So um, next slide, please. So that's another view that uh, shows you um, the, the other schools. As I uh, mentioned earlier, we are, we are becoming a hub of independent schools. Um, and so that, that shows you that um, uh, we are very close to them, actually. Um, and we'll see uh, even more on the next slide, I think. So not on the next slide, but it's just to tell you when they started. So we are not the pioneers there. We are not the first one. Uh, Amin Robinson was the first school to be in the area. Uh, and then we had the two schools, as we call them, Gillen School and Lake Washington Girls Middle School, uh, which are under the same roof, uh, just across uh, the street from us. Uh, and uh, more recently, Seattle Girls School uh, is just east of um, uh, Amin Robinson School. So we already learned a ton from, uh, from them. Uh, we are uh, in close contact with them. We see them uh, very often. So those are the heads of schools. Uh, so we have regular conferences like next week. Uh, we have one with the national, not national, Northwest uh, Association of Independent Schools. So we'll all be there. Uh, exchanging on, uh, you know, our experiences. Uh, and I, I asked them, uh, telling them that we had this town hall, I say, hey, can you just tell us what you enjoy the most uh, about being uh, in, uh, in Beacon Hill? Uh, and so those are the, the quotes that they sent me. So uh, I'll let you read them uh, at your leisure. Um, and uh, 
it was very inspiring actually when we had the opportunity to speak with them about their experience, their community, uh, how uh, community driven this neighborhood is. And so that's something that uh, I'm very excited about actually. So let's move to the next slide, please. So um, we, we talked about the, the history of Beacon Hill, uh, which uh, is very rich and very diverse. Uh, so um, I think that, uh, yeah, this, this is the quote uh, that is referencing, referencing to right now. So uh, you might know or not that uh, Beacon Hill was initially settled by diverse communities, including European immigrants, Asian immigrants, and African Americans. It's still evolving. And so uh, when you think about what diversity is all about and so we maybe we can move to the next slide uh, as you know cultural agility is one of our core values um, and um, diversity is something that we don't only uh, appreciate we embrace we are seeking for more of it um, and uh, so i will i would like to quote one of our students uh, former students so that is that cool to quote former students, uh, Mir Matia, if you are listening to us, uh, who uh, graduated in 2018. And uh, in a video that I really strongly uh, suggest you to watch, uh, it should be on our website uh, under the DI tab, I think, and maybe the admission tab. Uh, and Mir Matia is saying to us in this, uh, in this um, uh, video, diversity is one of these things that the more you have, the better it is. And so hearing this kind of thing from our students well, is quite inspiring. And I would like to go back to uh, uh, the quote that maybe you didn't have time to read, but uh, the quote from uh, Connor. Uh, Connor is the, uh, the head of the Lake Washington Law School. And uh, she talked about community, which is another core value of our school, and said uh, one thing that she really enjoys being in this neighborhood is that uh, you are being part of the community and it's not just being in it. So I will leave you with these words and now we'll, I promise that we'll uh, see some, some rendering. So I'll turn it over to uh, Nikki, right? Mm -hmm. Who is online with us. Thank you, Nikki. Yeah, hi. Um, thank you so much, Eric and, and Peter and Christian. Um, so myself, I'm Nikki and uh, in the room today with Eric and team, you have Corey and Michelle. And we're all part of this Spectrum and Malum team who are making this FAST project a reality for you all. And you've been seeing us around uh, at the town halls, around the school. You've been seeing us for over a year now. Um, and as we've been working through this whole design process um, so far, we've really been seeking every opportunity that we can to engage and meet with the FASPS community and understand more about what makes FASPS who they are. Um, early on, we were workshopping with students, with faculty, we met with families, uh, and more recently, we've been doing a lot of deep work with the pedagogical leadership team as we really start to get into more of the details of the design. And what we've really learned through this whole process, what we've learned in meeting with you all and all of this time that we've spent with you all, is that the FASPS community is really founded in culture. And when we say culture, we're talking about things that show up through art, through food, and through so many different representations of the diversity that Eric is talking about, the diversity of this community. And so, as we talk about FASPS as this Francophone and international cultural hub, it's really this uh, opportunity to amplify the vision of FASPS and understand how that cultural hub comes to be, how we show that culture of your community. The way that we're starting to think about that is to think about this hub as a mosaic. And that mosaic is that representation of the diversity of and of this community and a representation of the vision of FASPS. And we'll, we'll touch more on this in a couple of slides. The first phase, um, as the rest of the team has mentioned, the first phase of the Seattle Hub is going to be a milestone transition for the Cycle 3 and Cycle 4 community. So Peter was talking about how now we have the students who get to move from downstairs to upstairs. 
this is going to be that big opportunity as the students grow, as they develop, they get to graduate into the big city campus. They'll move over to Seattle and they'll have access to all of these different um, elements and amenities that make up that cultural hub. They'll have the library, the gym, the gathering spaces that form that cultural hub at their disposal in their learning environment. Um, and so the program, the spaces in this building um, are really prioritizing student learning and student development. And so it's going to have all of the necessary classrooms, the recreation spaces, uh, the specialty spaces, so your labs, the library, the specialist rooms um, that are going to support those 240 students, up to 240 students. We get to grow into this space uh, in grades four through grade eight. And as, as we talked about at the beginning, we really chose this site. The, this site was selected because it has the potential to accommodate the full vision of FASPS. And so right now we're talking about phase one, but we know that there is space to continue to grow into this site. Within the site, as we select the location for that first phase to land. So in this whole city block that we have, we think about where should that first phase be? And that was decided based on a whole series of different factors. So factors like solar, when we think about how we can get daylight into all the right places, um, like acoustics, as we think about the uh, surrounding traffic noises, for example, uh, we think about access, how are we getting onto the site? Um, and earthworks, uh, when we have a steeply sloping site with different soil conditions, that's really driving where we want to place the building. And so all of that, we want to do all of that and also optimize the day one program and maximize the potential for future phasing. And so what we really found through all of that to optimize all of those factors is that this building for phase one, it wants to be at the lower end of the site where you're see, seeing it now, the lower end of the slope. So at the downhill um, on the eastern boundary, and it's going to run along the length of 23rd Avenue South. Um, and so, so it's a building that's running along that busier street, but it's actually acting as a barrier. So it shelters the rest of the site beyond it from that busier street. Um, and then the whole western portion of the site remains this prime zone for future development. Thanks, Nikki. So um, this process of engagement that Nikki was sharing some pictures of over this last year and our design process and all of those amazing meetings that you all have shared time and space with us has helped us to identify four key goals or Sometimes we call them spatial aspirations, and that's what you see here. Grow and flow, share and extend beyond the classroom, uh, welcome and build community, and building as curriculum. And so what we want to share now is show you how that translates actually into the built environment. And Nikki and I are going to go back and forth as we walk you through um, these different aspirations. Let's go to grow and flow. So. When we were thinking about grow and flow, um, what we were thinking about is how the different programs um, are arranged. So how you move from the front entry, which is at the top right corner in the um, diagrams that you're looking at. And so how that connects to the large gathering space, what you see in red on the screen, that's the gymnasium, but also a place for community to your whole community to come together. Um, then moving to the second floor, to the library, and then also from the gym or the entry out into the adjacent um, exterior space, another place for um, community connection and gathering. And all of those programs together is what we were are calling that cultural hub. So on the left side of your screen, you can see that there's that pink box. Thanks, Nikki, for the cursor. Um, that that space of um, of the cultural hub with then classrooms above. Um, and so we're thinking about, right, how do these spaces select so that that also allows um, how they are used to grow. Then if we go to the next slide, um, this gives you then a sense of um, that connection. So the um, in the image on the bottom right, you see that's that gathering space, also the gymnasium with the classrooms above, and then those doors that easily connect you to that exterior space. So again, 
um, for uh, during school hours, connecting uh, those spaces before and after care, easy movement and flow and supervision. And then also if there's a large um, community event, that easy flow from indoors to outdoors, although not on a day like today. Um, and then uh, I loved, Peter, you again, I think both Nikki and I have a comment about moving to the second floor. So this idea of grow and flow then extends as we think about the classrooms um, and the other shared learning programs and lab spaces that are on the um, third and fourth floor. And so students literally, right, and conceptually then are moving up in the building um, as they grow older. A couple key parts to point out as well, the green spaces that are labeled admin and faculty, those are strategically located so that there are adults that greet students as they move um, from floor to floor. Um, and then similarly, another key point, if you look at the um, blue spaces that we have identified as um, shared learning or the middle school lounge, these are, um, similar an idea to the cultural hub connection spaces, but at a smaller scale. So it's a place where the, the community on that floor could come together to share a meal, to art, to make art. Um, and specifically then as you move up to the fourth floor with the middle school lounge, uh, as something we talked about actually with the middle school students, this is something special. It's a place for so socialization with um, for your older students. I'll hand it back to Nikki. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for queuing me up perfectly for our next spatial aspiration, which is share and extend beyond the classroom. And so in this sense, we really are the, the shared learning spaces, that middle school lounge, the shared learning that Corey was just mentioning, are really the perfect place to start to talk about this idea of what does it mean to have a space to come together, um, to have multiple classes come together, to do co-teaching, to have students have uh, breakout and collaboration spaces and space for staff and faculty to cross paths with students as well and have more intermingling there. Um, within this space, we also have multifunctional kitchens uh, and those can serve everything from, you know, after school snack from our auxiliary programs. They can work for student cooking projects. Um, we also have, and, and it's really about featuring and highlighting the food culture of the FAST campus. We know, and every time that we come and show up at your campus, there are always croissants, there is always food being served, and how important that is to this community. Um, same goes when we talk about culture in this space, we were talking about art. We want to make sure that there are walls where we can feature student art and that we have the infrastructure set up to bring that into the school. Um, you can see in this space also the mass timber structure that we have here. So we have glue laminated timber columns and beams in the, stru in the structure, and those are featured within these spaces. So you have that biophilic element of the wood in the space. And then above, over, above that, you also have this connection to the outdoors. When we're in the shared learning in the middle school lounge, we can see into the canopy of the trees that are surrounding this site. And so those shared learning spaces are really the types of spaces where we can feature the idea of FASPs as a mosaic. We talked earlier about this idea of the hub is a mosaic, that mosaic is that representation of the diversity of this community. And when we talk about that, we're really talking about this idea of blending the individuality, so every little, every student, every individual person with the larger whole. So what is our identity as a whole campus too? And it's this opportunity to weave in the colors, the textures that really ground FASPs in the Pacific Northwest and in this location specifically. And so the concept of the mosaic, it really comes directly from the FASPs culture and the teaching model here. So from 
individuality, so from that level of differentiation, how do we think about each student as an individual, um, all the way to that larger whole of the whole campus or the whole fast community, so the harmonization of how we come together as a community. Um, and so the mosaic is all about how we are viewing something at different scales. We're zooming in and out. And so we start over on the left here with the individual, with one student who even in and of themselves is made up of their whole layered identity, right? Um, but that one student has their place within the class. That class has its own unique identity within its grade band. The grade band has its identity within the cycle. We have cycles three and four on this campus. And then that that campus identity is also really an element of the larger fast community, this whole network of hub and spoke of different campuses. Um, and so this this framework that we're developing of the mosaic and it's a it's a conceptual framework, but it's something that's going to help us guide us through this design process as we continue to move forward. We want to really think about these identities. I'll pass it back to Cole. Thanks, Nikki. So um, building on that idea, the mosaic, we also think about that as we um, were uh, envisioning how that relates to welcome and build community. So thinking about the larger community and thinking about it right at these different scales, um, you know, surrounding uh, your particular campus. And so in this um, image, we're calling out a few examples. So for example, the cultural hub the idea is it's this beacon. Um, it draws you to the building and we've intentionally located um, much of the glass uh, at those those shared spaces um, and with the intent to kind of create this connection um, from the school to the surrounding community as compared to the classroom spaces that are up above with less of that visibility, and that's where the students are spending the majority of their time. And then we've taken the opportunity, the stairs is that, that taller structure that you're seeing on the right side of the image as a place, as one place to be able to integrate um, fast identity, and again, create that connection, that welcoming um, uh, relationship to the community. And then as Nikki has said in, in one of the prior images, this shows you that idea of how the building actually is functioning as a buffer to the busier street um, that's on the left side of the screen, 23rd Avenue. Um, can we go to the next slide, Nikki? And so again, to just reiterate, as um, Eric was saying, um, FAST is a part of this larger network um, and uh, really building on the richness of the community, both amongst other schools in the neighborhood, but all of the um, institutions that surround as well and how that supports that idea of cultural agility and really building on and, and strengthening that relationship to the community that surrounds your campus. Let's go to the next. So this is zooming in um, essentially to that prior image and then taking um, a section or a cut through the building to um, look at a, a smaller scale. So as if imagine that you were your pedestrian, you and your child are walking alongside the building and we wanted to capture how that would feel and, and what again is that relationship to the community um, at that human scale. So you can see um, what we're planning is there's a planting strip again between the street and the sidewalk to give you a little buffer um, between where the cars are and where you would be walking. And then similarly, another buffer uh, between the sidewalk and the building to sort of soften and make that a more humane uh, experience as you walk um, alongside the building. Um, and then we have been really intentional about where there are solid parts of the building and then where there is glass. Um, and that solid um, part of the building acts to, in two primary ways as we think about it. Acoustic privacy, like um, Nikki had pointed out with the sounds of traffic, and then also privacy. So we're being intentional about where you are seeing into the building along that main street. And as it's called out in that little call out there, eyes on the street from staff space, again, that gives um, that connection and awareness of what is happening um, in between, but really directed where the staff are. 
And then we wanted to think about too, how does welcome and build community shape our approach to safety and security? And so these diagrams that you see here, these are typical strategies that we integrate for all of our school projects. And so um, to highlight a few, that bold pink line that you see is what we call a secure perimeter. So with any school, we're mapping out where is that line? Um, and what you see here is the building on the right side of the image on the right there. The building is actually forming part of that secure perimeter or that buffer, as we said. And then there will be fencing that wraps around. Um, and in the image on the bottom left, you can see the line of that fencing around that outdoor play area. And then the slope um, creates another buffer essentially um, uh, to where the students would be in the outdoor um, play space. And then in the top right corner, you see there's two big triangles. It may be hard to read the text, but one is the main entrance where um, Nikki is circling. And then there is an outdoor entrance that would take you right out to the um, outdoor play space. And both of those are controlled entry points. And one of our strategies, again, that we do in all schools is try to minimize those points of entry. So it's very intentional how they are um, a controlled point. Now, the next image will show if we zoom right into that main entry um, main entry corner. And, um, you know, one of the things that we heard very early on when we had come to visit is that sense of welcome and that people know your name as you pass through the door. And so um, we have a little eyeball drawn <laughs> on the reception desk. But the point is, is that there is someone right there that is welcoming you, making that connection um, to you and your child as you pass through the front door and also providing good visibility and supervision to that um, front entry sequence and out to the surrounding neighborhood. Another strategy that we um, utilize on all of our schools as well is, and this is just one example shown here in this big circle, is what we call an AI phone. And it's basically the um, tool that we use. So as someone approaches, when those doors are locked, they would push the button and then that connects to the computer, for example, at reception, someone you can communicate back and forth. And then that person um, is able to buzz the person into a secure vestibule. So again, just one tool that we use and we're working with Brian and our electrical engineers to integrate, to determine where cameras go. So again, all these um, very typical industry standard strategies to create um, uh, safety and security means while also building a strong connection to the community. All right, thank you, Corey. And I'll take us into our final of those four spatial aspirations, those four key goals, which is building as curriculum. So we, are designing a purpose-built campus for FASPs. And what that means is we have the opportunity to design in all of these different learning spaces and, and ways in which we can learn from the building. And so that's gonna show up in a lot of different ways. For example, within the outdoor space, we have rain gardens and bioretention ponds. So it's an opportunity for the students to learn about the flows of water, to learn um, about how the water on our site flows all the way to the Duwamish. We have native planting on the site and trees that are gonna form new habitats for local wildlife. Um, and an opportunity to learn there. There's gardens that the students can plant things in and have experiments, class projects. Um, beyond that, we also have solar panels on the roof. Um, and so those can act also as a teaching tool, a way to learn about renewable energy in the city. Um, inside the building, we have this beautiful mass timber structure that I mentioned earlier um, and views of those canopies. So it provides this really biophilic learning environment for the students. They can learn about carbon sequestration of using timber structures. So there's so much that we can really integrate into this building that lets, uh, lets the teachers, the faculty move around the building and be able to point to something and learn from it, use it as a teaching tool. And so 
those four spatial aspirations, these are going to continue to guide our process as we move forward, as we continue to refine the design. Um, and so grow and flow, share and extend beyond the classroom, welcome and build community, and building as curriculum. These are four really key pillars that we're continuing to pursue, and you're going to keep seeing more examples um, as we continue to progress the design. And with that, I'll invite Michelle. All right, thank you, Nikki. All right, so I just want to take a moment to walk us through the timeline that we're working with to make this vision into a reality. The most important milestone, of course, is opening the building, lights on, doors open, and class in session. And that is for the 2026-2027 school year. So working back to where we are now, we're currently in the design phase. And to get a little more specific, we're in the design development phase and very broad strokes, high level description of design development is essentially getting into a greater level of detail on how the building will function and how it will look. And so as evidenced by uh, some of the lovely uh, slides that uh, Nikki and Corey just showed everybody. And so then design is going to continue into 2024. And then a major milestone for us in February of 2024 is our permit intake. And that's essentially when we take all of the architectural and engineering plans, submit those to the city of Seattle for the building permit review. That process will take roughly one year to complete. So by that time, 2025, February, we'll have our permits in hand and we'll be kicking off construction. And the construction phase will take about 16 months. And so that will give us a couple of months for the school to move into the building, start to get familiar with it, get comfortable and be ready to go for day one for school to start in September of 2026. All right. And so with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Steve to close us out. All right. Wonderful. Thank you. That's pretty exciting stuff. Uh, and so you may be wondering how are we going to get there? Uh, and so I can tell you as uh, uh, as the board chair, along with my fellow trustees, I spend a lot of time thinking about this question. And the good news is that uh, at this stage in the game, we're fortunate to have a pretty clear answer uh, on how we're going to get the uh, financing in order to build this, uh, this incredibly compelling vision. So we think it's about a $50 million product or project, pardon me. Uh, and uh, that's that's no small uh, amount. And so to fund it, we're looking for basically three sources. The first one is over many years now, the school has uh, been carefully guarding its assets. We, uh, as we said earlier, we own land nearby on Mercer Island that has gone well over the last few years. Uh, we've, of course, we try to manage ourselves conservatively. And so when you net it all out, we have a certain amount of assets and reserves that you know, that we will be bringing to the table uh, as kind of the kernel of our financing for this project. Uh, the second and probably largest piece overall of the project is a construction loan. Uh, and on this point, we've already had great engagement from banks in the area and, uh, and around the state. And one of the things that's helping us get that great reception is we're fortunate to have uh, our loan application guaranteed by the French government. So you may not be aware of this, but the French government does as official policy uh, uh, will guarantee loans for exactly this purpose for French schools around the world. Uh, and they don't guarantee just anybody. And so Eric and Susan and the team spent an enormous number of hours uh, dotting countless I's and crossing countless T's to get that guarantee in place. We're fortunate to have that now. I believe they'll guarantee 90% of our loan value, which is just, uh, which is, a, you know, a night and day difference. So that's the kind of the main component. And then, of course, um, we couldn't do any of this without uh, support from our community. Uh, and so we'll be announcing at some point uh, in the not terribly distant future, we'll be announcing a capital campaign uh, that will form uh, the third leg of the stool to us being able to fund and build this uh, school. So uh, we feel like to summarize, we feel like we're in good shape. There's a long road ahead of us. 
uh, no doubt about it, but we've had just phenomenal support from the community and really uh, the the staff and uh, and prior boards have done a fabulous job getting us into a strong position. So we're in a position that we can really deliver on this. OK, um, with that said, uh, that's it for the content. I'd like to uh, invite uh, any questions that we have either in the room or online. Uh, and between our architects and uh, uh, and our staff here, uh, we'll be happy to answer. Yeah, go ahead. Just um, maybe you have this off your mind, but for the funding, do you have a sense of one point three, or three parts, kind of a percentage of what it, what's, what's what? So, yeah, we haven't made uh, an official determination on the size of the capital campaign yet, and so that will uh, that will of course drive the whole thing. We have ranges that we're working with, of course, but the first step in a capital campaign is uh, a detailed study, and so we're undertaking that study at this point. Yeah, I, I remember that it was originally a plan to include the high school, and that was aborted because of the funding challenge. Presumably, interest rates are going up, so that. Yeah. Is there still plans and, and what does that conceptually look like? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we are still committed to uh, launching high school. And in fact, uh, we're, uh, Eric, I'll let you talk about the immediate step here. To answer the funding question, uh, actually, no, prior to interest rates ever moving, and Evan knows they moved a lot, <laughs> but prior to that ever, you know, our first goal is to get this program that already exists situated in our permanent home. Uh, we're phasing it for reasons in part due to the economy, but the high school program we intend to build is was always intended to be a second step. So first this, then that, but we will get there. And Eric, you may want to expand on that. Sure. So since I arrived here in 2010, I could see and hear that there was and it's been, there has been a huge appetite for high school for good reasons. Uh, so, uh, and the board uh, committed to uh, uh, driving a PCB study by 2030. So it doesn't mean that we're going to wait until 2030. And actually, uh, this year, uh, we'll have a task force uh, that will uh, focus on the vision of this high school. Uh, and uh, subsequent steps will follow in terms of uh, once we define this vision, the market, uh, and then we'll crunch the numbers. So then it will be in the position to see uh, if the high school will be there on this uh, uh, city block that we purchased and that we know from the beginning that we could, uh, as we said earlier, develop the entire program. It doesn't mean necessarily that it's going to be the case there, but uh, we know we can do it. Yeah. So there's a real estate allocation. There it, yeah. That was an important part of why the board chose to acquire this particular property. Uh, we looked at several, but this was the first property that we found that was large enough to accommodate the entire program, including the high school that we aspire to uh, build into. And in fact, as we've worked with the architecture team, uh, we the, and they didn't really get into the details, but the, the long term vision of even how they've laid out the, the facility is designed to sort of be built onto and together with the land. We think that we have I mean, we're sure that we have room for, for the whole program. A second question, you know, safety is our top priority for the children. And, uh, in light of the neighborhood there and the old schools that have experiences with and the businesses that have experiences, and um, is there a, an, an approach to maybe putting a permanent security guard on duty and as part of the staff uh, that monitors the perimeter and that keeps the people safe? Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, I wouldn't. I would say no at this point uh, because we don't. Uh, uh, I mean, first of all, uh, as I shared earlier, you know, some quotes of our heads of schools so as they've been around, so they've been experiencing how to operate their school there. And uh, in our conversation uh, with them, at no point they said, you know, that we have like big issues here. Uh, so uh, um, it's going to change, it's going to be a change, right, between being here and being an urban center, so we acknowledge that we know that. But uh, again, at no point we heard from these schools saying you, you should consider uh, you know, security guard, or we consider that none of them have a security guard, and yet uh, they, uh, their community is safe. Uh, and so obviously, as uh, we mentioned earlier, there are some uh, uh, standard uh, precautions and standard 
thing that we'll consider uh, in our building like in any other school. Uh, and 2026 is you know three years from now. Uh, so I would tend, I'd be tempted to say if we realize that here on Mercer Island we needed a security guard, we might do it too, right? So uh, I don't know how it's going to look like three years from now, but again, we uh, we are confident uh, that the building uh, will be safe, that our operations will be safe, and that the community uh, will help us uh, to to remain safe. Yeah. Sorry, I was just going to follow up on exactly what you said, and thanks for the presentation. This was great. The building looks beautiful. Um, my question is less in relation to the school itself, but more the neighborhood. Um, as you said, it's evolving, but I mean, it's, it, it's currently not great. And from speaking to a lot of other parents, I know there's definitely a, even with light rail access, concern with fourth grader walking around in that neighborhood. Um, what's and as you said, things can change in three years. But what are you? I'm just curious your thoughts on how to mitigate that risk. So, um, I mean, the, please chime in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so the building is one. Uh, our operation will be second. Uh, we, we, I mean, our intent is not to change neighborhood, right? As we as we said earlier, is to learn how to be part of it, uh, and. Uh, uh, and to, I mean, as I said earlier, here we do have sometimes uh, some security concerns, uh, and we had like uh, I can refer to, you know, once we had like a bomb alert, uh, and not us, uh, but it was at the J. So being so close to the J, we had to evacuate, and we found ourselves go all going to the city uh, council, uh, I mean the city hall. Uh, so we will need to adjust to those kind of uh, uh, safety concerns and if there, is, if there are any threats. Um, so, uh, I mean, other than that, we don't have like a, a full plan now. So we'll, we'll learn as we go. Uh, we'll continue to keep like uh, open conversation with the, the other schools, uh, with the, the authorities there. Uh, we'll have a safety uh, consultant uh, who will be part of uh, our process as well. Uh, but we don't have like a, like a, a plan now to just to say it's going to be exactly this way. I think that we will continue to. No, no, of course. And I mean, I didn't want to come across no intent to change the neighborhood. But sure. I think we need to be realistic about it. It's, it's not great. I mean, and that may change, but I would not describe that as a safe neighbor, neighborhood for children. So I hope there's at least going to be a conversation about that, not that there's a full sure. yeah. stop. Yeah. Okay. Let me uh, add on three quick things here, and then we'll go to your question. Um, just from speaking on behalf of the board, um, the, the first one is there is absolutely no higher priority for us as an institution than the safety of the kids, period. And so as Eric said, we don't necessarily have three year long vision to see exactly what will happen then, but I will personally guarantee that the board will will ensure that Eric has all the resources he needs to deploy a secure and safe program for the kids. Speaking as, as a father of children that will be in, you know, there as well as as a trustee. Uh, the second thing I'll say is we're not alone. Uh, there are several other schools that are there uh, and more presumably on the way. Uh, and the last thing I'll say, and this one is not speaking on behalf of the board, just me personally, but as I've, I've spent a lot of time with this project the last couple of years, and my, my point of view at this point is that time is on our side. The neighborhood has had a lot of development. There's been a lot of sort of property turnover, and it's in a transitional phase at this point. But the places that the place it's going to looks very much like it's sort of on the upswing. Obviously, that's one person's opinion, but um, I do think, you know, it's sort of a one way street given the proximity to the city and the number of other schools that are there. But I'll go back to the first thing I said and end with it again. There, the, the highest priority will be to ensure that we have a safe and secure place for our children. Uh, and the board will absolutely empower Eric to do anything necessary to make that happen. 
And the other thing I would add uh, to that is that we are not only benefiting from our uh, team who uh, you know, are experts in uh, building schools and, and making them safe, obviously, but they've been part of this network of French Aperitif schools worldwide. So we, are, we can reach out to uh, a team that is expert uh, in security and safety uh, in schools all over the world, in uh, countries and places that uh, you know, have uh, challenges as well. And the other thing to that is that the French government um, uh, would support us. Uh, so there is a grant uh, application that we will uh, apply to, uh, and we can get even funds uh, from the French government to help us, uh, I don't know, to uh, pay for this uh, uh, you know, uh, material that you just showed us. Um, so, uh, well, 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 as you said, we're not alone uh, in this project. Susan, Susan, Susan. Oh, sorry. I, I just had one data point. So I, my child um, was at Hamlet Robbins School when it opened in 2015. Prior to that, they were in the location that Hamlet Robbins had, had in Capitol Hill. When they were in Capitol Hill, I got frequent active shooter potential drills, right? Never once did I have one when she was at Hamlet Robinson when it moved uh, to this area. So that's one data point. You can take it for what you, what you want. But I just wanted to say that about my experience in the two different locations. And I'd like to add on, and, and actually Christiana and I live pretty close um, to this neighborhood and we've seen a lot of these changes. Um, she's had her kids, my kid was here. I, I echo what Steve says, it is the number one concern and consideration as not only a trustee, but as, as a parent, as the committee co-chair, it is top of mind. So uh, rest assured there. Uh, I might put you on the spot for a second, but <laughs> the, the development that's going on there right now, and especially uh, there's a couple areas right next to it that, that look scary. I, 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 understand that there's uh, but all of those have been purchased they're all under development it's all newer construction multi-family homes it, if you look at what is being developed uh if you, it, it, and there's a number of things that who oh the urban link just bought the, the one that was the burger king and that is going to be going in not too soon after the school goes in and so all of that, I think, if you look at that transitionary period, in three years, it's going to look much, much different. So, um, in, in yes, yeah, so uh, it, it was not really the question, but it's like it's kind of like a, our wish list that it would be nice to have a, like a shuttle bus between Seattle campus and then also Mercer Island, so a younger kid. Younger children will you know, drop off oh the first island, shuttle bus back and forth in between. So the kids just needs to go to middle school, but the younger kids can go to the other side. So I don't know how many we have a bus, but it would be nice that we have like a shuttle bus back and forth in the morning. Mm -hmm. And then we live in the north, I mean, for like a Redmond. Mm -hmm. And we didn't even expect it to have, a, we have to commute to Seattle. And I understand that with the trains going back and forth between. Mm -hmm. But I would really try to put all my kids to to the light trail, go to the Seattle. However, I'm a little bit concerned about walking, walking yeah. for 10 minutes in the rain. Yeah, yeah. So it would be nice to have a school shuttle bus mm -hmm. again. I don't know, maybe you're going to be communicating and partnershiping with other school exactly. to have a purchasing a the big like a yellow bus and it goes to the shuttle like an airport. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> we can do better than the airport. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, or the teacher is going to be needing, whoever the yeah. other person who is going to be shepherd is going to be needing at the Redmond a town center uh, new stations mm -hmm. or Rose Island station. They want to be a shepherd to mm -hmm. travel together. So it feels like a little bit of like a field trip every day. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, don't feel like uh, you know, kids is going to fall asleep and then forgot to going back to another <laughs> or, you know, 
got into the finger <clears throat> on the door or something. You yeah. Know? So it would be nice. I know it's going to be extra money, but if it's going to be like a parent, uh, volunteers or yep. teacher who is going to be going to a meeting with the same station, going to the school together, sort of us, I really don't feel comfortable with my kids going to walk in the rain and, <clears throat> you know, snow. Not necessarily the shooting or kidnapping, but it's just more like a, that area I used to live. Their traffic driving people yeah, yeah, is not sure, very sure. good. Yeah, so sure. it's going to be, you know, running to the traffic, so running to. So and then my kids is not that smart enough to, you know, watch <laughs> that. So that would be nice to have a, some kind of shuttle bus. Yes. Like and, an airport. And if we have an example of uh, an experience that we uh, went through because when, during the pandemic, Yes, uh, you remember did. That. Yeah, exactly. Uh, That's what so I'm thinking. So we partnered with the Jerry State School in Bellevue, uh, near Crossroad area. And so we had a show at that time. So I uh, see Stacy here, our middle school head, <laughs> who was very familiar with the, the entire uh, process. But uh, um, we, we've done that. We have a fleet of six buses, maybe more in the future if we, if we need them. One very interesting data point is that if you were, and I, sh I should have thought about that, to show you how spread our community is. Yes. That's impressive. Yeah. It is very much impressive. Um, so, and and that's why also we, we started this uh, bus uh, service. And we'll not only uh, continue to do it, but we'll certainly grow in this service. So, uh, yeah, well, we these campuses are pretty close, which is going to help us too, um, using our buses as a shuttle, or, and uh, we'll, we'll do that. So Thank my you. question is for the design team, and I see uh, they talk about the fencing. Mm -hmm. Are people outside going to be able to see my kids, my kids inside in the play area? Is that be wire fence or we are? Fence? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we we haven't designed the fence yet, um, and what you'll see on the uh, on Walker, we have a, a solid area that accommodates trash and bike storage and all of that. So the actual open area is somewhat limited intentionally between the play area and Walker. Um, and then we're still designing what that fence is that um, is along the south side. But that's a great, great question to think about. Like, what is that transparency? But the sidewalks are sloping up. Um, so we'll just think about how, what those views are as you walk the sidewalks. Thank you for the suggestion. Yeah. And we have some great natural buffer too, with trees and things that actually already are functioning to help uh, kind of tuck that area in as a natural buffer. We have a question here first. Oh yeah, I have a related question to the yeah. play area. I, from what I can tell, it seems like the play area won't extend the entire city block. So I was okay. curious what the rest of the space will be used for. Uh, on the west side? On the west yeah. side, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. yeah, so that is that future um, development area to accommodate the ultimate growth of the yeah. campus. And we're right there at the um, downside of a, a smoked area. Um, so at the moment, that's for future expansion, um, not part of this particular space. And, and the end game will we'll use all of it. Okay. And when you say slope, it slopes up towards. So yeah, slope. exactly. Yeah. So it's sloping down to the school. And then I should also say um, there will also be a fence that wraps around the entire block as well. So there's a fence at the outdoor play area and then a fence that wraps around that entire block. Um, yeah, you don't want people just going. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah, for sure. Can you go? Yeah, I have like, two questions. I understand that the high school project is going to be coming up, but I don't think the, if the staff is going to be starting to build in high school for four year grade. You're going to be adding as you grow, or is it something like uh, we're going to have a uh, ninth grade to 12th grade at the once, or some other school like independent, uh, they'll be a uh, basis independent. They've started to gradually adding a one by one grade to, as we grow. If this is the kind of that I understand that it's not has not done it yet, but it's uh, it'll be interesting to see mm -hmm. if we already know for sure for ninth grade, which is meeting with the end of the cycle four, and then applying for the bread or whatever that they call it for middle school graduation. Mm -hmm. The ninth grade program. 
Okay. Yeah, yes, exactly. Then, you know, I'll be very much interested to stay until ninth grade because uh, we are planning to go to public schools. It doesn't really matter. Yeah. Yeah, so the answer to that is that given the our program, mm -hmm. uh, our bilingual program means that we, we expect our students to uh, to master a French language, at least when they are uh, in, in ninth grade, right? Mm -hmm. So most likely, uh, it's going to be this first uh, uh, scenario that you described that uh, right. one, year yeah, after one year after the other. Yeah. Obviously, yeah. setting the vision, though, mm -hmm. and, and the commitment that if you stay in ninth grade, you'll be able to go to the 12th grade. Mm -hmm. uh, now, uh, as you said, we haven't studied the work on the, I mean, it's not that we haven't studied the work. We worked a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll resume the work and see if our conclusions uh, of the, this, uh, uh, it used to be called the Fast Tour 2030, that was a task force that um, uh, was on for in like five, five to eight years ago, I would say. Uh, so we'll, we'll use this material, all this work that has been done with our community, and to see how it applies now. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, going back to your question, most likely it's going to be one it's year. Like one by one, right? Yeah, we will not start like yeah, great time to yeah. And then the other questions I have is that it's to be um, 10 million capital campaign for a few years is going to be really, really aggressive. Just curious that um, have you ever kind of thought of it with asking for the family to have bond or as a deposit, just like uh, Bill the Children's Academy did it? Because when we apply for the school a long time ago, uh, we choose it for the fast track. They asked for like six thousand, five thousand dollars, and then the school borrowed those money and the interest. Incurred is going to be going back to the family, but you got those money for a certain number of the year to do it for capital development. And then when the kids is going to graduate, they return for the bond and put the interest rates back, something like that. Mm -hmm. Have you thought of it that kind of scenarios for uh, getting some uh, funding from your market academic in investment company like international partners or James? Or something, or it's just like I was still thinking that the funding is going to be coming from about three choices that you just mentioned. So, our current plan is as I just uh, presented, but we're a step down the road. We have hired a firm who is a professional capital campaign firm. They, they've been through this a thousand times and uh, they've just begun advising us on the process. And so it's a great question, and I'm sure we will raise that question with them, but it's too early to say it. I see that as something that there's. Yeah, one, one thing that I would like to, to add is that uh, many of you, and thank you for that, uh, completed uh, a survey uh, over last summer, mm -hmm. and this survey was generated and sent by CCS, that's the name of the consulting firm, uh, and when they presented to the board uh, at the board retreat in September, so we were very much encouraged by the, the result of the survey, which showed a strong support from our community uh, for this project. So that's why we are here in front of you talking about it, because we know that you know it's going to happen. Uh, so going back to your question, if we ever thought about it, yes, we did. Over like, uh, I mean, I know that yeah, in my 14 years here, we, we had this kind of conversation about how to be creative to get there, to, to go to have our permanent home, because this is our ultimate goal. And so that's why we discussed that as well. Uh, but as uh, uh, Steve just said, this is not something that we are digging further now, I mean, this option, uh, because we know that there is an avenue for us uh, and the capital campaign, uh, you know, we, we are, will be successful. So we are uh, strongly believing that. I have some online questions. Yes, yes, please. Okay. Um, so the first one was, do we have a scheduled date of when we think the high school will open, or is it still theory? <laughs> no, we don't have a schedule yet, right. that's for sure. Um, but as we develop this project, uh, we will not stop thinking, as, as I just said, the high school feasibility, uh, feasibility study slash vision uh, setting will be on. Uh, and it's actually never was off. 
so we'll continue to think, and not only think, but to build this phase two. Uh, it's, yeah. Okay. I was also going to add, as everyone knows, that our school is a school that has to is, is build on a pyramid. And the pyramid means that we have to have a really strong base. We have to have a lot of students coming in at the base and continue to keep them. And you know, we have attrition mostly to due to relocations back to France or other countries. And so what we have done strategically, strategically now is to open, because we are so hemmed in here, we cannot add another classroom here, we cannot keep growing on this site. So in order to make our next phase over in Seattle and that middle school as strong and successful as possible, we're building now the base. We continue to build the base. We have that uh, secondary little offsite campus going for the little kids so that we can continue to have a really good number growing in. And then that by moving kids to Seattle and starting in the third, fourth grade, we're opening up space here for that to continue to grow. And then in Seattle, we have more classrooms per grade than we currently have here. And by by making all of that being really as robust as possible, we're setting the stage for the future high school. I really believe really that now strategically. We really couldn't do it on the side before because of the absolute maximum that we have here. But now we finally feel like the pieces are falling into place. We're free in terms of you know getting all that growth going. And we, you know, I would have been involved with this school for 20 years. And when we built this, we were at about 100 students. You know, when we built the first phase of the campus, we built it. And suddenly, a year and a half later, we were at 300. <laughs> <laughs> and then suddenly, we're at more than you know, 30. And so once we have the space and we will continue, then I think the, the future for the high school, I mean, obviously, there's a very thoughtful plan that needs to go into envisioning everything and planning for that. But we are really, really working towards building the base now and, and getting ourselves in. And to follow up on that, and we, we always talk about that triangle. That it, my mental model of that is not making it a triangle, but making it more of a rectangle that just goes up. And so you have you have everything that goes up through high school, and that's you know everybody moves up with that. Um, but then addressing a, a different component about kind of the design and we went through numerous numerous renditions in different ways of phasing and what are the components that we're going to need not just for the middle school but what are we going to need for the younger kids what are we going to need for a high school and so when we thought about a lot of this phasing we thought about the amenities and the program requirements for these other levels we also thought, well, maybe we're going to need a different gym because this gym is good for middle school, maybe for the elementary, but we might need a bigger size gym for a high school. We might need to think about parking because, well, you know, high school kids drive. <laughs> um, I've learned that in the last year or so. Um, so, they, uh, so you, the phasing and it, Nikki, can you go back to one of the renderings and I, I just want to stress part of the, the phasing. Um, we talked about a little bit. So if he's still there. I don't know if we can see. Yeah. I don't know if he's there. So, yeah, so <laughs> that, that rectangle at the kind of top right of the building, that's the staircase. And the, the cool part about that is it's then the staircase for another wing going up that street right, there, right so that we kind of talked about it but now thinking about the spacing and where you want to go and what grades you want to add to it we're already setting ourselves up for for that and then where do the other components lie within the other side of the site and i think both uh, uh, Nikki and Corey, you both talked about you know the spacing and staying on the east side of this site. It gives us so much opportunity. That entire west side of the site is kind of a blank canvas for us to to really expand our program. And going back to the online question about the high school and everything you heard from Peter and Christian is 20% right and accurate and. Uh, in this past 2030 task force that we have, we also talked about, you know, this model, this pyramid uh, model, and how we can have a 
a cylinder or a rectangle. Uh, and th they, are, they are possibly, there are some solutions like uh, by having other entry points later with, for students that might not have necessarily the French background that all our other students would have. And so this kind of model exists in our network of French schools, so we can learn about, about it. Uh, I can give you names of school, like uh, the one in, in Houston, Francisco. Uh, so we, we, we know that this model works. So we'll need to see if it is the model that we want for our school. Uh, and about the schedule, what we are going to do now is set the vision. Set the vision of, again, what is the high school that we want for our community, uh, the market, then we'll study the market, so that is the market plan. And number three, we'll refresh the numbers and just say, okay, that's the money we need to get into this space. Uh, and then we'll have the schedule. Uh, so we need to do all this groundwork before uh, getting there. I feel it's a little bit of a double-edged sword, though. I think from a parent's perspective, you want to, you want to look for a long-term partnership with the school. And I, I get the strategy, but from a retention perspective, I would argue you may actually increase your retention if you yeah. <laughs> make that longer commitment sooner than later. I understand all the circumstances. Yeah. But that's just another perspective. That we, we it's more of a staging thing than a commitment thing. I, I don't know, not to nitpick your words, and just I, to be very that's clear. That's the question gets asked. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, another question online was about uh, tuition raises related to funding this project. Would, will there be a linkage there between uh, funding and, and tuition raises? That's the I slide that Steve presented. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, that, that's really, that's really Completely true, actually. That is the slide I presented, and that's why you'll, re you'll recall that on the slide I presented, there were three buckets of funding. Our existing assets that have come from our investments over the years and our, our management, uh, the loan that we will get for construction, which will be the bulk of it, and a capital campaign. Uh, nowhere on here is we're raising tuition to pay for the project because that's, that's not the way that that works. Uh, our tuition funds our operations. Uh, not entirely funds our operations. We rely also on the generosity of our community and our annual fund and our auction to round out our operations. Uh, but we're very careful from a board perspective of making sure that we are operationally healthy, separate from our ability to deliver on this project. And so they're not uh, they're not connected. I would make an analogy with what happened in uh, the school history when we started in the middle school. I remember uh, when we started in the middle school, it started, it cost a lot of money, right, to, to, to start a project like that, a program like that. And so we knew that uh, we had some parts of the school that were in the black and some others in the red, and so it balances things out. So we don't we don't plan on saying, okay, well, uh, we'll need to, to uh, increase tuition, as Steve said, because we need to make this work. Uh, so we'll, we'll look at uh, everything we operate, uh, factoria here and there, um, and um, it, it will not be uh, uh, like a, a change uh, in our in the way the board uh, uh, look at tuition increase. Yeah, exactly. Okay, and the last online question well, was a statement that they were excited about this, but they wanted to know what the community can do to help this project move forward. Oh. Thank you for <laughs> the question slash statement. I appreciate that. Uh, I bet more than one of us will have some thoughts on that. <laughs> Very excellent question. Let me just start by actually just saying thank you to the community. You, you have been phenomenal through the entire time I've been associated with the community, um, the entire time my kids have gone through here over the last decade. Uh, it's been fantastic. And, it, and as Eric said, the support that the community showed over the summer as we were just beginning the capital campaign assessment process was overwhelming. And and is uh, we're we're so grateful, um, and so all I would say is you know continue that kind of support, continue spreading the word, continue generating energy in the community, continue giving us feedback uh, as trustees and on behalf of Eric or, or, on the uh, to the staff as well. We are we are listening. We are eager to do the best that we can uh, for this just incredible and unique community that we have. But thank you so much for the question. That's all for online. Okay.
I have another question. Um, you mentioned earlier about how all of our families come from all over the region. So I hate that we're a community that's dependent on cars, but mm -hmm. we are. How do parents fit in to this scenario? Where do we park when we come to pick up our kids if we want to talk to other parents? Where do we come if we want to come to something like this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we, we've talked about this and um, you know how so cars would be around. And mm -hmm. so, uh, uh, do you want to say a word about it? Sure. Yeah, so if you aren't parking, but if you're just uh, picking up and dropping off, mm -hmm. then we would encourage, and we have a traffic engineer who is also yeah. part of our team who's working on an analysis. And again, this is for every school we do this. Um, and sure. as we think about the impacts to the surrounding neighborhood. And part of that is we've been looking at how many open parking spots there are in nearby streets because the city wants us to do that as well. Mm -hmm. um, so for pick up and drop off, it would work in a clockwise fashion. That's what we always want to do so that any students getting out of the car would be right adjacent. Um, and we worked that around college to 22nd to Walker um, so that nobody, that, that nobody would be going. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Um, yeah. So up at the top of the screen, nobody should be dropping off. Um, at, on 23rd at the material. Mm -hmm. If you are coming to visit the school for any reason or you want to walk your child, um, mm -hmm. there is parking within the neighborhood and then walking from there. Mm -hmm. um, I know there's different strategies. We talked with Efron about possible um, other opportunities with parking. I don't know if there's anything you would want to add on there. It, let me just answer your question if there is, and if there's an event like this. Again, the you know, if there's something, if you want to linger, you know, this becomes an operational question with the school in terms of opening that access to the outdoor area where families would be welcome to come in. And then you're still, you are within that secure perimeter with your child. So if your kids are playing and you want a place to hang out, then that would certainly be a possibility as well. Um, if there was some kind of gathering like this, depending on the size, that um, the gym gathering space is being planned for not only gym and PE um, and athletics, but also as a community gathering for performance. So thinking about technology right. and seating and all of that. And that's, again, a reason why it's on the first floor with easy access from that front entry mm -hmm. spot. Um, and again, with that, then that activity could also sell out you know, to the exterior. And, and mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of capacity at the building. My concern is that there's not a lot of capacity for cars. You're right. And I, I wish we weren't dependent on them, yeah. but everybody's yeah. coming from very far away. And the transit isn't going to be a solution. And maybe, I mean, I'm just thinking out loud now, but just mm -hmm. going back to this transportation uh, you know, service and how we can use our fleet of buses, we could even maybe, you know, say, we, if we have like a uh, performance, uh, just use our 72 uh, bus, uh, uh, passenger bus and just say, you know, park on, on here and it's 10 minutes away and we'll, we'll take off at that time. So we can just have like, I don't know, uh, 70 parents just in the bus and having a good trip uh, <laughs> to get to the performance. Who knows? I'm, I'm not saying that uh, that's the way we are, you know, uh, thinking of our operations, but uh, it's true that, uh, maybe, right? Mm -hmm. Just to give you an idea, when we started this project, so we first, and we communicated that with everyone, we first wanted to build a school for the entire, uh, um, all, all our student body. So, and in this scope, uh, we had uh, a parking garage, but not for 400 cars, uh, but for, you know, a dozen of cars. So, 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 uh, 30. Yeah. Yeah. We started with 72 and then we looked at the price and we went down. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, uh, it is not in the scope as you can see. Uh, but the for the phase, excuse me? Where will the teachers learn? The teachers, I mean, going there. So they will they will need to do what uh, I mean, Robinson does and you know, what uh, uh, other schools in the neighborhood can do as well, which is to find uh, you know, some parking spots or use maybe transportation, public transportation. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it's it's different. Mm -hmm. Let's be honest. Uh, it's going to be different from from being on the show. Uh, and we're still learning about what does it mean. One more little uh, anecdote. My my two older daughters that graduated from here uh, mm -hmm. are currently at Seattle That's Academy. Yeah, on Capitol Hill urban campus. 
and when we when we show up for parents night you know what they they will do it they'll make an arrangement with a uh, close by business and borrow, you know, rent their parking or or run buses back and forth between buildings or whatever and it works it's different as eric said different from mercer island but there are actually there are a lot of options not that these would be the ones by the way eric please by all means but there are some options there it's also a little different from the neighborhood that we're looking at though and coming yes. back to the safety concerns walking to a car at night mm -hmm. is a different scenario in that neighborhood or even Walking around daytime is a different scenario in that neighborhood. is 4 p.m. very soon. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah. Right. But all these things need to be considered. I agree that uh, you don't have what you want to do. I was just going to point out there are a lot of buildings that are currently in the Virgin neighborhood, and a lot of those buildings, the multifamily structures, with base in the base will have on the other ground floor we have the restaurants and coffee shops and whatnot. All of that is really tremendously changing right now. And a lot of those buildings will actually have parking that's part of the buildings. And a lot of those buildings are actually coming to members of, of this group and are saying like, oh, we really mind renting you parking spaces. So I think there's a lot of synergies that are yet to be continuously continue to be explored. It's not like you know we so it, it's a, the type of thing where, you know, on event nights, it could be like, oh, this building is making a certain number of spots available, and people can park mm -hmm. there and it's just across the street. So there are a lot of things that we still need to work through that are possibilities that many of us have presented. Yeah. Actually, I think it's the in-between that's probably the trickiest. Like, mm -hmm. finding a couple of parking spots, no problem. Figuring out a solution for 100 people is probably actually easier, mm -hmm. but it's the middle ground yeah. that I, I think is pretty complicated. And something that a lot of our schools do too, right? There's coordination between the different schools. So curriculum night isn't held at um, like Washington Girls Middle School at the same time that you might be having an event. So that then there's cross coordination and sharing of curves and parking spots that may be available. And part of that too is right like that prioritization around how that limited square footage and so a lot of the schools that you have highlighted, right? Seattle Girls School, for example, is one of ours where they prioritized how much limited land they had and there's a couple parking spaces and then they have arrangements with nearby institutions, right? That aren't, you know, then the church, right, isn't going to be using the space that's nearby, for example, and so there's different synergies. My other, oh, sorry, oh, go no, 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 please go, go ahead. You take a turn, I'll come back later. <laughs> uh, so I, I had a question about the SJCC re redevelopment plan, um, and I think Eric has been in discussions about this. I'm curious what you've heard from them about the changes that might be coming in, what it would mean for our school and on this campus. <clears throat> yeah, so we are in uh, there, um, we have regular meetings with Amy, the, the CEO of the J. Uh, so every time if anything is released, uh, Previously, I have a preview of it because we have this kind of relationship. Uh, and so uh, I would just start by saying I'm very happy for them. I'm very excited about this redevelopment because uh, it's it's much needed. Uh, and so we fully support this redevelopment. Uh, also because it's going to benefit our school. Uh, as, we, as we know, we continue to be here. We use their facility on a daily basis. So we hope that, uh, again, it's going to work and we support that. Uh, as you might have seen, it doesn't touch this area. So there is nothing, because we, we are in relationship with them, and so I, we, we, we express the desire to stay. Um, and they would like also us to stay. So um, um, as you might know, uh, it's not a done deal yet. Uh, so hopefully their project will be on the docket in December, and so they will. Uh, they are seeking for a rezoning. Uh, as you might know. Uh, so if everything goes the way uh, it's supposed to be, I can so uh, uh, we'll continue to uh, partner uh, very uh, regularly and uh, that, that'll, that'll be a great uh, improvement for our community as well. Part two. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually, yeah, a different thing. Um, Looking at the phases, knowing that this phase one is getting us grades four through eight, mm -hmm. what's the 
pie in the sky and or realistic version of phase two and phase three? When do the other grades go over? Knowing that 50 million is a pretty heavy lift. Yeah. And what's realistic for those next rounds? Yeah. Do you want to? Um, I'm quite certain that you guys have thought about this because I've seen some of your estimates, but I don't want to guess and get it wrong. So one thing that I can you might remember, maybe not because we said a lot of things, but uh, when I presented the three campuses, I told you, that it's, uh, showing the one on Richmond and the one we are now, that uh, it's showing like tiny way through through grade three, and I added, and maybe more. Yeah. Uh, because uh, if there is demand uh, to keep going here for more grades, because we have some space, right? And we will have this school open there and we'll have the the, uh, the, the student that we, uh, we need there. So we might be able to continue here as well uh, to maybe go to, uh, again, back to grade eight. Don't quote me by saying that it's going to happen for sure, <laughs> but we are trying to leave, uh, you know, options open uh, at this point. So uh, well, going back to your question. Side by side schools. Excuse me? Uh, Perhaps. Side by side schools. Potentially. I mean, we. Going back to your question, because I really want to answer it, uh, the phase two might be just to say, let's just forget about Nurse Ryan uh, and we'll move everyone uh, over there, meaning that uh, we'll have a uh, tiny white creek case with gray head there and nobody here. That's an option. I don't, I don't know if it's going to happen. I don't think that might be the best case scenario, uh, but it is a possibility. High school is also back in the, you know, the conversation. If we think that uh, we'll keep uh, Mercer and as it is, and maybe still growing, and then we don't need to have tiny way pre case through grade three over there, let's build the high school there. Uh, we might just have like grade four through 12, uh, ultimately, there in Seattle, and we would keep uh, tiny way pre case through grade three or maybe grade four here. Uh, so and another thing that uh, we didn't talk about today, but the same way we started uh, an additional campus in Factoria. So we are looking now and presenting that uh, at the Forum for Night. We are exploring that now options to uh, add a campus, a preschool campus in Seattle. Not necessarily next to our site, it can be somewhere else. Because this, uh, going back to your uh, description, uh, Christiana, these schools, these campuses will feed, you know, our program so that we will have a successful path uh, to middle school and then high school. So we don't have, as you, I, I, we don't have like a clear phase two now to communicate with you. Um, but um, we are, as I said, yeah. Well, there's hope. There's, <laughs> yeah, no, I don't, yeah, there's, I don't, I don't actually mean it that way. I mean, like, um, there's finally hope. When, but when you put, a, when you try to put dates on it, what is that hope? For the, what would our next phase be? Kind yeah. Of thing? Yeah, I, we, I don't think we have a date yet for it, although I will defer to our building committee. I, I would, but, I would couch it this way is that the, the 50 million I just said is you know, a big lift in, in getting that. The, the concentration needs to be on this first phase yeah. until we until we get that, until we have a, a, the realization or you know we're, we're close to getting the keys to the building and we have a better sense of what is what is the demand. I think that's a, a factor that we haven't talked about in, in this part of the conversation is where are we seeing the demand? Are we seeing the demand being high school? Are we seeing the demand, you know, are we getting enough kids through first through third grade here? And do we need to, does that need to expand? Do we need, do we need more third grade classrooms in Seattle? I don't know that yet. But the, the vision, you know, if you, uh, being this Franco, uh, Francophone hub, this international hub, and seeing a whole different community uh, join because we know that we're going to get somewhat different demographics maybe a lot more people from seattle maybe from north seattle maybe from south seattle that are going to come to to that school so there are a lot of things in play here to say well what's the demand going to be and until we kind of get a sense of what that is i don't think we can decide on what the right space to be 
So long term, the goal is to have two campuses or more, but for sure two large campuses. Like Most likely, I would say. Yeah. Uh, and we are not going to wait uh, 10, 15 years to develop this phase two. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's for sure. Um, I mean, first of all, I think it's going to be very important for our community to see what we can do together. Because we haven't had a capital campaign in a while. Uh, so uh, the last capital campaign was in 2008 or 2007, but to open in 2008. And again, we are very much encouraged by what we hear, uh, whether it, is, it was through the survey or by the presence here or by everyone asking questions and how they can support. Uh, so uh, I, I'm very, uh, very confident that uh, you know, as we will build uh, this phase one, as we will uh, hear from the high school feasibility uh, task force, uh, we'll you know, put things together and, and design this space to, uh, in the, I would say, not in the long term, but in the future, but certainly not even like a short term, like one year, but probably somewhere in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, for a feasibility for high schools, um, the university has been looking at the line you have done. Uh, are you going to be giving more feedback? from the current families, right? Yes, we will. That, that's uh, when I describe the three steps. One is to set a vision that is aligned with our mission, vision, and value. But we don't want to be another school. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the first thing. The second is to look at the, the market. So the, the current community will be involved in the first and second step, right? Because the vision is not going to come from nowhere. Uh, the entire community is part of it. Uh, so, uh, and we'll, and we'll ask for more, right? Because we need to expand, as we, we just said. We, we, and there is a demand. Uh, we are the only, uh, the only international school from Thailand who can actually play the here. Well, we, our kids, my kids, when they're graduating, just 27, I mean, 2027, so we're not going to see it. But it's to me also a very um, ambitious goal to have a high school just because we have so many great private high school and nationwide and we will be competing we will be competing and I would like to support the education but at the same time and realistically I don't know I mean it will be a little difficult to have a, all those you know really nationwide top school like XCF family and big side push and all those area and how much we can have, and then like, if you have like IP or French Bacalomera, it might be different. But it will be interesting to see. And I'd like to support as much as we can, but um, for me, as a, as a fifth grade parent, to be honest, I've been selfish. I would like to have uh, enrichment in the fifth uh, mid middle school as much as we can, mm -hmm. and then they can fit us into a good high school or good public high school and I'm very impressed with the middle school program that I have seen for open house and if we were committed in staying um, the middle school but well as a selfishly you know I would like to see keep enriching all those middle school bigger and have a good reputation mm -hmm. to bring into the really various school. That would be also another you know thing to do. But no, totally. And it, A, this is why, as Eric said, we have we have to study the question. And, mm -hmm. and it's a very real thing that we need to do to talk to people and so on. Uh, and B, I think our success uh, in K through 8 earns us the right to have a vision for 9 through 12. But yeah. there's no question that the program that we are delivering our community is obvious. It's the one that's here today and it's our number one priority. I might just add, because I take care of the high school. I don't think that vision that you described is incompatible right? between preparing uh, middle schoolers to be able to go to some of the very best high schools. Where, um, and an example of that is for students going to boarding schools and getting into really interesting, competitive uh, boarding schools within the nation, which is something that I didn't see when I first came to pass uh, six years ago. So that, that vision of a really competitive 
middle school is not incompatible with that vision of also having a high school that will meet the needs of all of the different types of families that are imagining that, whether they're a current family, mm -hmm. um, a family that is going to potentially join us at an entry point along the way based on what that program looks like. Mm -hmm. So keep that vision strong because um, right, they, exactly. they, they really are going forward. Okay, uh, I just glanced up at the clock and we have, uh, I told you I get paid by the word. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for coming out tonight. I, I just want to once again, thank you both in person and online for all the engagement, the questions and for all your support over the years. It's really, uh, it's really what the reason that all of us who are volunteering do this because of this fabulous community that we're part of. Um, I will also be glad to have offline conversations with anybody if there are more questions. I will volunteer Eric as well <laughs> uh, and uh, thank you and it's not the last time hall you know we'll have <laughs> more. so thank you so much for being here thank you Steve. thank you all the privileges all right thank you. Thank you.